And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure welcoming uh, Professor Richard Squire um, for uh, this evening's 3CL seminar, um, which we are presenting um, with um, thanks to Trevor Smith, who are supporting our seminar series. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard uh, to you. Richard is the Alpin J. Cameron Chair in Law um, at the University of Fordham um, Law School. He has been a member of that law school uh, for uh, 15 years now. So it's a, it's a little um, celebration perhaps for you, Richard, 15 years. Um, but he has, um, he has taught at other places, um, for example, at uh, Yale Law School, uh, Columbia, Columbia Law School, and uh, Duke Law School as visiting professor. His um, primary interests are corporate law, corporate bankruptcy, or as it's um, correctly called, corporate insolvency, Richard, I, I assume. Um, similarly, antitrust, uh, which we call competition law, I think, and securities regulation. Um, but um, there may be terminology differences, but we have a lot in common, and that is our interest in uh, debt finance and debt finance law. Um, Richard, um, I think, um, will present something that may be interesting, um, both from a research perspective, but also from um, a perspective of um, studying the law, um, as it hopefully nicely ties in with those of you taking the corporate finance course and uh, probably looking into debt finance at this time of the year. Um, just a few more words uh, on Richard and before I hand over, um, Richard has uh, twice been elected um, Teacher of the Year at, at Fordham, and um, he has clerked uh, for Judge Robert Sack on the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and um, has also a short history of three years as a lawyer, Richard, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, that said, um, Richard's um, seminar is on uh, the law of corporate debt, a unifying theory. Richard, I'm very grateful uh, that you uh, found the time for us today, in particular knowing that you've taught today uh, and you still have some voice left uh, for us uh, after a long teaching day. It's great to have you here. Um, uh, I can also say on a personal basis because we're working on a, on a project together and I'm very much looking forward uh, to your seminar. Uh, over to you, Richard, and also, of course, a very uh, warm welcome to, to Professor Louis Gallifer, who also joined us, um, so all the, the two 3CL directors are present. Now, over to you, Richard. Um, before you start, start speaking, can I please invite everyone um, to um, signal in the chat um, if you would like to ask questions? We'll have time for questions, and I think it's always a good thing if you know already if questions come up during the uh, course of the of the. Uh, presentation um, that you leave a note for me and then later uh, you'll have um, the opportunity to discuss, comment or ask questions and please do make use of that um, this evening. Um, I'm aiming to then really close uh, punctually uh, at 7 p.m. so that you can all run to batteries or wherever you get your food from. Um, now I've, speaking, I've really spoken enough now and over to you Richard and thanks again uh, for being with us today and um, we are really very much looking forward uh, to the seminar with you. Thank you, Felix, for that very uh, kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you um, uh, today. And um, I'm very pleased to see such a large turnout to hear uh, me talk about our project. Um, and it is our project. Uh, Felix, um, uh, is, is besides being a good friend of mine uh, and a colleague generally, it's also the, a co-author on this particular paper. And so um, we are in um, uh, an early stage. Uh, we've working on it for a while, but we're still putting our thoughts together because there's some complexity, I think, to what we're trying to do. Um, uh, good complexity, uh, but uh, but we are um, but we're but it's a work in progress, and so we'll be very interested to hear your comments and questions. And I should also say uh, that although Felix is a co-author on the paper that I'm presenting today. It doesn't mean that he's responsible for anything I have to say. Um, and I completely expect that at some point he may uh, interrupt or may, I, well, not Felix, he's very restrained. So he'll, he'll hold till the end, but he may have questions on what I'm saying. So we're, we're, each of this uh, is thinking about it in his own way, although there is a significant amount of overlap um, in what we're trying to do. And the final project uh, obviously will be a joint work. So, uh, so I, prepared some PowerPoint slides. Uh, so as Felix said, here's the name of the paper, The Law of Corporate Data Unifying Theory. 
Um, there are three co-authors. Uh, that's there's me and Felix, but Zohar Goshen uh, is uh, Columbia Law School is also on this uh, this project uh, with us. Now um, we have some goals in the paper that I'll kind of lay out first, uh, and um, the, the this this title, the law of corporate debt: a unifying theory. What what are we trying to unify exactly? Well. We are interested in a category of legal mechanisms that we are calling, maybe for lack of a better word, although I think there is some usefulness in the term, the law of corporate debt. And by that, we mean all positive law mechanisms, non-contractual positive law. Here we have a notion uh, we have in mind statutes or regulations or maybe judge-made law, but not contracts. So general law, positive law, all positive law mechanisms that augment, amend, or override private debt agreements between business debtors and their creditors. So we're interested here in um, bankruptcy law. Uh, Felix claims there's another term for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and But it's business bankruptcy that we're interested in, um, or insolvency law, and uh, not, um, not co consumer bankruptcy, which we think, or consumer insolvency, which we think has some special purposes um, and some special considerations. Now, what are, what are some examples of all of these positive law mechanisms that we are throwing a umbrella around, a uh, term around that we're calling the law of corporate debt? Well, obviously it includes bankruptcy and insolvency law, which significantly augments or amends private debt agreements. Most conspicuously, the automatic stay or the moratorium uh, interferes with collection mechanisms that are available under uh, contract law, um, acceleration clauses and so on. So that would be one such mechanism. But fraudulent transfer law, uh, or maybe the law of fraudulent conveyances, and um, Felix, if at any point it's useful for you to translate what I'm saying <laughs> into English, um, uh, you may, uh, you should feel free to do. In a, you should feel free to do that. Um, but these are. This is a type of remedy where uh, uh, a creditor can sue a third party to return value to the debtor's estate uh, to make it generally available for all creditors. It's not contemplated by contract. In fact, it can't be amended by contract under, secure, under current law. Um, secure transaction law would be another example. It does augment private debt agreements um, by giving priority to certain creditors over others. Also, it effectively overrides certain debt agreements if the uh, unsecured creditor ends up un being unable to um, uh, collect. Veil piercing effectively does this kind of thing. It's not available in contract, uh, but it's an extra uh, mechanism added to contract, essentially of corporate creditors, equitable subordination, and so on. This is a very large category of remedies and measures uh, that have this augment, amend, or override uh, impact on private debt agreements. So first of all, we want to just recognize this, this category exists. We offer a term for it, um, but we want to go beyond that. And also, um, I'm getting used to how you advance this here. We also want to, uh, in this, uh, talk about, um, I'm gonna change my screen just for a moment, um, just so I can see a little bit better certain things. Okay, excuse me for this interruption. I want to be able to see the time, so I know I'm not going uh, too long. Uh, so I need, to, I need to adjust that on my screen. Now I bring this back up. Okay, um, so, um, if you look in the current literature and you ask, what are the purposes of these various mechanisms uh, that, uh, that augment or override, that change in some way, debt agreements between debtors and their creditors? You don't get one answer for everything. So we've identified a general category, but we don't see one, if we look out there and what's out there, we don't see one identified purpose. And, um, you see a variety of purposes, uh, and uh, purposes uh, vary not just in terms of uh, what is assigned by commentators or maybe judges to a specific type of remedy uh, or, uh, or mechanism, but also amongst mechanisms. So um, these are just samples I pulled out of law review articles. I'm not attributing them to anyone in particular, first of all, because none of them is particularly uh, controversial or original, but second of all, there's nothing important about them. You, you could find a different uh, definition for a lot of these things. Um, but bankruptcy law or insolvency law, a very standard definition is something like this. Its purpose is to solve a collective action problem on creditors, provide a fresh start. That's more typical if it's an individual business or com uh, a commercial debtor rather than a um, cons consumer debtor, and preserve going concern value of a business. Okay, so that's a very typical thing you'll see in the literature. What about secure transactions? You'll see things like promote economic security, because it provides lenders with a promise of repayment. Sounds good. Who doesn't want that? Fraudulent transfer law. 
purpose of fraudulent transfer law. I just found this this morning in a review article. It's to protect creditors from unfair transactions that hamper their efforts to collect from the debtor. Okay, I don't think any of these is controversial in itself. I don't think they're wrong. But we know from studying insolvency law that all of these features of law interact in an insolvency proceeding. Obviously, the bankruptcy law itself uh, sets the, 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 creates a setting, but then secure transactions, certain creditors will have different rights than others that are enforced in that context. Fraudulent transfer actions may be brought. They're certainly brought under in American law on behalf of the estate. So you might think, well, if all of these are happening together, it would be useful maybe to think about, are they serving a common purpose? And, and interestingly, if you look at these definitions, there's, there's actually a certain amount of conflict. So if the purpose of secure transactions is to promote economic security by providing a lender with a promise of repayment, that's actually abridged uh, or limited by bankruptcy law. Um, certainly the promise of immediate repayment uh, is impaired by the moratorium or automatic stay. Now the repayment may eventually happen, but certainly it's not as good as it is in secure transaction law without bankruptcy law. So these two purposes seem to be now partly cross purposes. Look at fraudulent transfer law to protect creditors from unfair transactions that hamper their efforts to collect from the debtor. Well, a secure transaction makes it easier for some creditors to recover, uh, 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 easier for some to recover, but harder for others. So, um, and you cannot, at least in the United States, typically set aside a secure transaction with fraudulent transfer law. So these two, as are written now, start to look like there's a bit of a conflict. Um, and so the question is, are we satisfied with this collection of individual purposes, often referencing different concerns? and seemingly in conflict with each other when we look at how they are enforced collectively. Well, um, in this, uh, uh, this paper, we say, um, maybe we can uh, not only define a general category, which is the law of, of corporate debt, but also identify a unifying purpose for all of these different mechanisms. So that's an ambition uh, of our paper. And we offer the following. We say that the, the, the purpose of all of these different mechanisms under this umbrella term bankruptcy law, fraudulent transfer law, secure transactions, and so on, is to reduce what we call the conflict costs of debt. And not to reduce them as far as to, to zero, but reduce them beyond the point to which parties can reduce them by contract alone. So these are extra, extra contractual mechanisms, and they're doing something, their goal beyond what can be done by contract alone, and reducing this thing that we're going to define as the conflict costs of debt. Uh, what, so what's a definition of the conflict cost of debt, this, this, this thing that all these mechanisms are aiming to reduce? They're the costs that result from the fixed prior structure of debt claims. That structure enables parties to engage in actions that enrich themselves not by creating wealth, but by shifting losses, or if you prefer risk, uh, on to others. So um, I always find it very useful uh, when teaching business law and thinking about business to think of two different types of transactions. Um, one where it's mute, there's mutual gain, there's, a, there's it's non-zero sum, and I think the law should encourage people to engage in mutual gain transactions, but people can also take actions that don't produce mutual gain, but cause one person to be enriched at the expense of another. Um, uh, and, uh, and certainly debt contracts create a structure, a payout structure that enables certain such uh, conduct, or we're going to call it misconduct, uh, because it's not socially beneficial, um, uh, en enable such misconduct. And, um, and any such misconduct that uh, results from this the structure of debt is uh, generates what we call the conflict cost of debt. And we're saying that these, this, these mechanisms exist to, um, to reduce it. Now, um, this debt-induced misconduct that we are concerned with comes in two general uh, uh, forms, um, uh, depending on who is exercising control. Um, if the debtor is exercising control, we call it debtor misconduct. And if the creditors are exercising control, we call it creditor misconduct. So we're taking all debt-induced misconduct and dividing it into two categories. Okay. So let's talk about debtor misconduct first. Debtor misconduct results from residual loss indifference. So the term we're, we're, we're suggesting here to think about the structural problem that we're concerned with with debt, with, with debt. Once a debtor is insolvent, further losses fall on the, its creditors rather on the debtor itself, or if the debtor's not its person, uh, on the equity holders who uh, control the debtor. Um, and so this creates a structural incentive. So just think about this for a moment. If you have a company who, that has $100 in, uh, in debt, 
uh, and the assets are worth $150, uh, uh, the first $50 in losses, if the assets are declining in value, all fall onto the shoulders of the equity holders, borne by the equity holders. But any losses beyond $100, if, if the, the value goes to 90 or 80, remember the debt's still $100, all of that loss is now falling onto the creditors instead. And so beyond, that, uh, beyond the point of solvency or the point of insolvency, the shareholders experience residual loss indifference. They're indifference to losses beyond that amount. That is the structural problem that creates incentives for these types of value destroying misconduct. One that is very well known in the literature is overinvestment or asset substitution, This uh, where the, the company um, uh, in, uh, invest in high risk, high reward projects that may not have an, a positive expected value if you take into consideration their impact on all investors. But if you just take uh, into consideration their impact on the um, equity holders, they're positive. But that's because there's a greater negative expected impact on the creditors. A deep loss in insolvency uh, more than uh, is not borne by the equity holders because of their residual loss indifference. Um, if a company is insolvent and it does this, it bets the remaining assets, let's say, and buying lottery tickets to try to get back into solvency. This is called gambling for resurrection. Um, I like that term, um, uh, and uh, I think it's very evocative. Um, but that is just a special variation on uh, overinvestment asset substitution. The point is this, though: if a company had no debt, or if the equity and the debt were held in equal amounts by the same people, there would be no incentive to go uh, to engage in this misconduct. It only is an incentive that's created because of the possibility to externalize losses onto creditors because of the shareholders' residual loss and difference. Lingering for resurrection might be more common, uh, although not as, um, I think, spectacular sounding or uh, sensational, I should say, as gambling for resurrection. This is a big problem in American bankruptcy proceedings where a, uh, a, a company files for bankruptcy, the debtor is in possession, the managers keep running the company. It's currently insolvent, but maybe it will be restored to insolvency, to, to solvency, excuse me, in the future, just because of uh, variability in uh, earnings. And so you can think of a company as a call option from the perspective of the equity holders. And even if the option is not now currently in the money, uh, it may be go into the money in the future. Uh, and so if you hold on to your equity cl uh, claims long enough, maybe that future will arise, it will lift back into solvency, and then you can emerge from bankruptcy. However, during all of that lingering time, the cost of the bankruptcy proceeding are being borne by the creditors. And so you have this lingering for resurrection problem, probably more common uh, than gambling for resurrection and bankruptcy, um, uh, but it also is a type of debtor misconduct. Debt dilution is a very common one. We know if you increase the company's debt equity ratio, without increasing the interest rate being paid to the old creditors, the one who lent when there was a lower debt equity ratio, that tends to shift value from the, uh, the, the creditors to the equity holders uh, because of greater losses experienced by the creditors in cases of insolvency, which the shareholders are indifferent to. There are some others in voluntary subordination, correlation seeking, underinvestment is a problem when a debtor is insolvent. I could dilate on any of these, but these are all examples of debtor misconduct but they all result ultimately from the residual loss and difference, which is due to the structure of, of debt claims. So how do we prevent debtor misconduct? Well, you can try to do it by contract. You can put financial covenants in your debt agreement. Also, any acceleration clause is basically a way to do this. Once you see that the debtor is, uh, is engaged in some kind of mischief, you say, okay, I, I, I want my full amount of uh, the, the, the principal due now. And certainly contract law has a big role to play. But there are limitations on contract law. And the biggest one when it comes to debtor misconduct is that the standard remedy for breach of contract uh, in common law jurisdictions is damages. And usually debtor misconduct is not discovered until you know that you, until the debtor is already insolvent. Um, and, and not only that, but insolvency increases the incentive for debtor misconduct. And at that point, the damages remedy is going to be ineffective. Um, what good is a 100 pound judgment against someone uh, who already has uh, his or her assets or its assets, if it's a company, blanketed over several times with debt owed to other people? Um, and, so, um, and so contract law, the main remedy available is simply not effective uh, because your typical defendant doesn't have the money to pay the damages, which is the remedy offered. This, is a, this insight here is not uh, original to our paper. Uh, it's fairly well known in the literature. Uh, we're just identifying here uh, the, 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 the contractual limitations 
said that again, the limitations on contract law or in contract law on preventing debtor misconduct. So what does positive law do? Well, effectively what the positive law does, and this would be anything aimed at debtor misconduct, fraudulent transfer law would be the biggest example, secure transaction law is the, another big example. It gives creditors a property or quasi property right in the debtor's assets. Security interest does this explicitly. Your collateral now is something that you can grab even if it's been conveyed to a third party if you're a secured creditor. But fraudulent transfer law kind of does the same thing. It, it throws a, a, a kind of a collective property interest around the debtor's estate once it's insolvent, enabling creditors to recall assets and so on. So this is giving us, if it's a property interest, it's good against the world. It's good against third parties. And you want to write against third parties because you're, 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 the, you're the second party, your counterparty to your contract, the debtor, uh, is going to be um, insolvent and therefore effectively judgment proof. Voidable preference rules have a similar um, uh, uh, effect. Um, they prevent the debtor from paying out some creditors in favor of others. Okay, so here uh, some uh, so the, what the positive law is doing, it's plugging a hole in uh, the limitations of contract law. Creditor misconduct now. So creditors can also exploit the, the structure of debt claims uh, to enrich themselves at the expense of others. But here, there's a symmetrical problem. Remember, the problem with the debtor is the residual loss indifference. As assets drop in value, once the, the debtor hits insolvency, any losses beyond that point, the debtor's indifferent to. Well, and we call that residual loss indifference. Uh, uh, ooh, uh, I, I didn't update my slide here. Um, I, uh, there's, a, there's a typo. So, but I'll, I'll just, I think I can keep talking as I do this. This should say uh, creditor misconduct. Um, it's creditor misconduct that results from uh, residual gain indifference. So, let me bring my screen back up. I want to make sure that says that correctly. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so creditor misconduct creditor misconduct results from uh, uh, residual gain indifference. Okay, so what's happening here is that. Uh, as creditors uh, recover money, um, they only care about recoveries up to the amount of their claim. Any increase beyond that, they're indifferent to um, because uh, it, it redounds to the benefit of other creditors or if the company is solvent to the, uh, to the, um, to the debtors, to, to the equity holders of the debtor uh, itself. And so uh, they, um, they will be indifferent to gains beyond what they are owed. And in fact, they may engage in conduct that destroys value beyond what they are owed, uh, because those gains beyond that, um, they're indifferent to, they fall on other people. It's just the symmetrical nature of, of, of a debt. This creates structural incentives for creditors to do some familiar things. First of all, value destroying asset grabs. As soon as you know that the debtor is struggling, uh, you immediately foreclose, you try to grab your collateral, you bring a lawsuit um, and try to grab as much as you can. This can, uh, this will maximize the individual creditor's recovery, but it will destroy going concern value. Um, so additional value, going concern surplus is destroyed, but you don't care as long as you're being paid in full as a creditor. Also, this is going to increase payout variability. Um, some creditors get everything, others get nothing. Um, and that uh, will be value destroying if we assume creditors are risk neutral. There's some other ways that residual gain and difference creates uh, creditor misconduct, which are these two that I just mentioned are fairly well known in the literature, but we're going to identify some others in the paper. Um, often creditors are entrusted with running auctions, um, either explicitly so if they're secured creditors or you effectively have creditors running auctions in American bankruptcy proceedings under Section 363 or they're doing it in collusion with the debtor. And think about it, if you're a creditor and you're selling off your collateral, uh, you actually don't care if the price of the a collateral that is fetched exceeds the amount you're owed because you can't keep the excess. So you may prefer a fast sale or a collusive sale. So your residual gain indifference is gonna skew incentives there as well. Also, the fact that you have residual gain indifference will make you under monitor the debtor for debtor misconduct. Um, uh, if you are a very good creditor and you're monitoring to make sure that the debtor doesn't give away assets or engage in asset substitution and all those things, when you monitor as a creditor for such misconduct, you bear the full cost of your monitoring, but any benefit uh, that is, exceeds what you would recover is externalized to others. So you create a positive externality. We know that if there is a positive externality from something that generally will be undersupplied. Um, and so this residual gain indifference will result in under monitoring of debtor misconduct. 
It also may result in under enforcement of credit protection mechanisms, such as fraudulent transfer law, if the, the creditor who brings the action bears all the litigation costs. Um, there's also an underinvestment problem in the debtor's insolvency if creditors exercise control, again, because um, gains beyond the amount that they're owed they don't care about. Okay. So how do we prevent uh, uh, creditor misconduct? Again, you can try to do it by contract. So contract role has a contract has a role to play here. The most common uh, way uh, that we see uh, uh, an attempt to do this is by having a collective action clause and a bond indenture. This prevents the holdout problem. So you can have a workout uh, whereby a value creating workout um, lifts a company back and back to solvency, protects going concern value. Uh, and it binds all creditors not, uh, as long as a majority vote for it. Um, so that's a classic creditor misconduct uh, solu uh, solution to creditor misconduct by contract. Auction rules can be imposed um, in American law. This is typically done by a judge trying to make sure that an auction of the company is not just for the benefit of the senior secured creditor. Again, though, there are limitations on contract law. There's a lack of contractual privity amongst creditors often. They're lending at different times. Uh, and so they may not be subject all to the same indenture. Um, and so then you can't use this. You cannot pre prevent creditor misconduct by contract if there's no contractual privity. And there's an under incentive of debtors to place creditors in privity. You could think, well, they'll all do it through the debtor. But the debtor also has an incentive, often has incentive to collude with one creditor at the expense of the other, such as by giving a creditor, a late creditor, a security interest in exchange for a lower interest rate that would subordinate previous claims, um, uh, make voidable preference, make preferential claim payments, and so on. So debtors lack incentive actually to place creditors in privity. Positive law thus once again comes in um, and makes um, does some mandatory things. Here there's a mandatory collective procedure. The bankruptcy or insolvency proceeding would be the classic example. So we have an automatic stay or a moratorium, uh, and uh, this is the maybe the sine qua non, the defining feature of your typical um, uh, uh, insolvency proceeding internationally, really. Um, and this prevents the asset grab uh, amongst creditors. Um, there's another thing, however, we want to exercise and uh, sorry emphasize in this paper, which is that. Collective proceedings, uh, insolvency proceedings, also usually have collective enforcement of debtor misconduct remedies. So we think of bankruptcy law or insolvency law as really solving problems, of, or, the, or the literature normally talks about it in terms of solving problems of creditor misconduct. Uh, there's a the common pool problem where creditors are putting their, their individual interests over the collective interest. But we also say that's true, but it's also solving problems of debtor misconduct by having collective enforcement of debtor misconduct remedies, fraudulent transfer actions are brought, what will preference actions are brought, equitable subordination is enforced. Why is it done in a collective proceeding? Well, it's done in a collective proceeding because the positive externalities that are generated by debtor misconduct remedies now could be captured by the creditors collectively. Um, so it's not just an individual creditor bringing a lawsuit for himself or herself, which is possible in America under state law, under fraudulent transfer law, but, 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 a, but a trustee bringing on behalf of all of the creditors. So there you also have a, um, a debtor uh, misconduct um, uh, solution happening uh, uh, in the collective proceeding as well. And there's a good reason for it, again, that has to do with the structure of debt claims. And here, again, with the residual gain indifference that creditors face. Okay. One of the things that, so, 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 so far we've kind of described a problem and we proposed a, uh, a, um, a, a way to think about it. So we've said, okay, there's the, uh, the, the positive law of corporate debt. We've defined what it is, very broad category. And we've said it, but we can, we can distill or identify an underlying purpose, which is to reduce the conflict cost of debt, which result from debtor and creditor misconduct, which is this kind of conduct resulting from the structure of debt claims. Well, what are the practical benefits of, of this analysis, of this description of the problem? Well, um, we propose uh, that not only should the, the, the purpose of corporate debt to be reduced uh, misconduct costs of debt, but that means it's not reducing debtor conflict costs individually or creditor conflict costs individually, but the sum of the two, which we're calling the misconduct costs of debt uh, or the conflict costs of debt. Um, but notice the trade-offs between these two are unavoidable. Measures to reduce one will tend to increase the other. So the goal is not to get creditor misconduct all the way to zero or debtor misconduct all the way to zero. You can't do that because almost any measure is shifting control from one group to the other. If you shift control in one direction, you'll reduce one type, but you'll increase the other type. 
Rather, we just want to make um, conspicuous trade-offs that the current way of thinking about these mechanisms doesn't make as conspicuous, largely because it doesn't talk about them in terms of a common purpose. So here's just one example, bankruptcy proceedings or a solvency proceeding with an automatic stay or a moratorium. Certainly the automatic stay, which prevents creditors from collecting uh, uh, individually, reduces creditor conflict costs, reduces your common pool problem. But it actually increases debtor conflict costs, both pre-bankruptcy and post-bankruptcy. How does it do it pre-bankruptcy? Well, as we saw earlier, there is an under incentive for creditors to monitor for debtor misconduct because of the mismatch between individual cost and collective benefit. Interestingly, grab law, the law whereby the rule whereby creditors can race for the assets and if they win, they get to collect in full before the late, the, 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 the slower moving creditors get, get anything. That somewhat offsets the under incentive to monitor because if you monitor and thereby pounce first, you may get paid in full you capture more of the uh, benefits of your monitoring for yourself. Um, so that actually is a, 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 a non-bankruptcy mechanism that somewhat corrects the problem associated with the creditor's residual gain indifference. But if instead you have a rule, a pro rata rule where all creditors recover equally, that incentive is now blunted. And so pre-bankruptcy debtor conflict costs may rise in anticipation of the automatic stay in the moratorium. Finally, there's post-bankruptcy debtor misconduct arise if you give the, um, the, uh, the, the management of the company more time to gamble for resurrection or linger for resurrection because the company is not instantly dismembered. Okay. So there will be lots of other trade-offs among these mechanisms. That's just one uh, 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 illustration. Now, we, uh, we, have, we identify a positive purpose for the law of corporate debt, which is to reduce the conflict costs of debt. But we also identify something that should be excluded. So we also, uh, our theory suggests, and this is just a hypothesis, but I think it's something we're thinking about. We're, we're, we're making an affirmative statement that certain things are not the proper uh, um, concern of lawmakers who might override debt contracts, commercial debt contracts. And that would be uh, the, uh, any measure that is aimed not at reducing conflict costs, but at reducing the competence costs of debt. The competence costs of debt are the cost of good faith mistakes made by debtors or creditors in exercising control. So let's say I were to lend uh, some money to Felix uh, to run a company. Uh, Felix is an entrepreneur, he's got a great idea. I have some money lying around um, and I wanna make an investment. Now, why would I, if I'm gonna lend my money to Felix, why wouldn't I also say, well, I'm gonna run the company since it's my money's at stake. Why would I let Felix run it? Well, presumably, and certainly would be true in this case because the competence costs would be lower. Uh, I would say, you know what? Felix will do a better job. He, he knows the business better. It's his idea. Maybe he has time to, to focus on this, whereas I uh, currently am distracted by other things. And so I think that if either one of us runs the company, we're going to make good faith mistakes, not resulting from conflict of interest, but just because humans are humans, uh, that, uh, that reduce the value of the company. But I think that I'm gonna, he's going to make fewer mistakes than I am, and so I am going to delegate to him. So the original lending um, or any investment starts with a transfer of money, of capital from investors, and it could be equity or debt, to managers with the goal of reducing competence costs. As an inevitable byproduct, conflict costs arise. Now, Felix is not just managing his money, but my money as well, so there's that conflict. Um, but, um, but the original goal is to reduce competence costs. What we're going to argue is that competence costs generally can be reduced effectively by contract alone, and there is not a legitimate reason for the law to override uh, contracts for purposes of reducing competence costs. Now, we're not making that about claim about consumer debt, but we are making it about um, a commercial debt. So we are defining a broad purpose for the law of corporate debt, but we're also cabining it in a certain way. Um, why do we think there's no systematic reason for contract law to be unable to deal adequately with competence costs? Well, first of all, damages are not usually used as the remedy for good faith mistakes. Usually it's simply a, a relief of someone for his position um, uh, if he's deemed to be incompetent. You'll see this in the, the business judgment rule, for example. Um, contractual privity is unnecessary so long as claims are tradable so that less competent people can sell their claims to more competent people. Uh, there's an illustration I could talk about this, uh, something in the American Trust and Denture Act, which is clearly a provision designed not to reduce conflict costs, but to reduce competence costs. The American the Trust and Denture Act actually makes it more difficult for creditors to, by contract, use a collective action pro, uh, provision in a bond indenture. It's called a collective action clause or a majority action clause. 
um, to override, um, uh, uh, to, to, to punish holdouts. Um, and the American uh, statute actually um, interferes with that. We, it, it does it for paternalistic reasons. And we will argue in the paper, I won't get into it now because I have limitations on time. Uh, but that would be an example of what we think is not a legitimate purpose. Okay, uh, I'm almost done here. So summary, summary of our contributions from our paper, and this is a preliminary uh, list. Um, so uh, the contributions list may shrink, we hope it expands, but anyway, by offering a unifying purpose for the law of corporate debt, we aim to one, provide a pedagogical framework for understanding this area. I, I, I just like having this notion that, that maybe all of these, um, these, um, these, these different provisions can be thought of in terms of a common purpose uh, that we can identify and discuss. Um, I think just pedagogically in terms of teaching ourselves and other people what's going on, that's interesting. But obviously if you reveal, reveal, reveal a common purpose amongst different mechanisms, trade-offs become uh, clearer. And finally, we've established a limitation on the proper role of the law. Um, so there's some, uh, there, uh, the second and third bullet points here have um, potential reform implications or they have prescriptive rather than just descriptive implications. Okay, so, um, ooh, I, I went longer. Uh, uh, I apologize for that, Felix. Um, but, um, but anyway, uh, I, that's all I have to say in terms of the presentation. Um, and, um, and if anybody has any questions or comments, I would love to hear them. And Felix would as well, I'm sure.